Islam tells us about rights, but at the same time tells us about limits. Always in Islam, if there's rights, there's limits to offset, so you know where the limits are. Don't play with making something haram when it's not haram. If you examine what Islam really is teaching, and then examine what the condition really is. If we ignore reality, this is suicide. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabi ajma'in wa shahadu wa la ilaha illallah wa ashahadu wa muhammadin abduhu wa rasul ma ba'd. I've heard so many Muslims say statements that when I went to check it out with the real scholars of Islam, it was so bogus that it was embarrassing to imagine that people would stand there with long beards and wearing, you know, their shawar kameez and stand up in front of a congregation, a jama'ah, and start preaching something, and then you go and check it out. And what they said was wrong. It isn't Islam. So, one of the things they will tell you is that the Prophet ﷺ is sinless. He doesn't have any sins at all. Have you heard this? Okay. And that everything he does, from the time he's born to the time he dies, Wasallam, is absolute wahi, and there's absolutely no mistakes on his side. I've heard that. I've heard people say that. Now that means, according to the Quran, he's not a human being anymore. He becomes an angel. He's an angel. He's not a human. But the Quran clearly said that he is a human. And that Allah sent a human from amongst yourselves to give you this message. So now which way am I going to go? Am I going to believe the Quran? Am I going to believe this sheikh over here is telling me that the Prophet ﷺ is like an angel. He has to be able to make some kind of mistakes, otherwise why would he say Astaghfirullah more than 100 times a day? And why would he tell his wife that Allah had forgiven him for his future and his past sins if he didn't have any? That doesn't make any sense, does it? And then again, why in the Quran would Allah say to him, Abisa wa ta'ala, he frowned and turned away. If you know Surah Abisa, chapter 80, it's real clear that Allah is admonishing Prophet Sallallahu because he did what? He made a mistake, he turned away from a blind man who came to ask him a question about Islam, but he wanted to make dawah to these non-Muslims, and Allah is saying, never mind about them, take care of that new Muslim that came in. And by the way, that's a subject that we really are weak on today. And then in Surah At-Tahrim, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala questions the Prophet Sallallahu why do you make harma, haram, something which I didn't make haram? And Allah gets real tough on the Prophet Sallallahu chapter 66 if you want to look it up. Because he had made honey haram, because he misunderstood, his wives were just teasing him, playing a game with him, saying that his breath smelled bad because he ate honey. Then it come to find out they were joking around playing a game, uh, he got a pretty upset about it, because, of course, because Allah admonished him. But it was to teach us, don't play with making something haram when it's not haram. And that's back to our subject, isn't it? Also, at the same time, don't make something halal that's not halal. What will happen if you do? Same thing. Why? We'll go back to the Quran again one more time. Go to chapter 9, Surah At-Tawbah. Look at chapter 9, verse 31, and see right there real clear what Allah is telling you, that the Jews and Christians took their rabbis and monks as partners with Allah. That's what it says. So you know what happened? Shirk, exactly. They were making shirk. But Adi ibn Hatim, who used to be Christian, he said to the Prophet ﷺ, they don't do that. They don't, you know, they're not worshiping those guys. Prophet ﷺ said, oh, yes, they do. He said, do they accept halal from those guys, but Allah made it haram? And do they accept haram from these guys, but Allah didn't make it haram, he made it halal? He said, yeah, they do that. And Prophet ﷺ said, in that way, they worshipped them. This is why when you sit with the real ulama, the real scholars of Islam, and I have, alhamdulillah, many times in many different countries, 
I never found one real scholar who ever was in a hurry to give a fatwa about anything. I never met one who was in a hurry to say, Haram, brother! Halal, brother! And how many of you heard of Yusuf Karadawi? You know who's Yusuf Karadawi? Yes. He's probably one of the most well-known of all the scholars on the planet today. And although you may not agree with his rulings on things, I want to tell you a statement that he said. Dr. Karadawi said in one of his writings that any of the scholars can make something haram. They could, you know, if, there, if there's a question mark is what he's talking about. If there's a question on an item, it's easier to say, uh, haram, brother, and stay away from it. Because on the day of judgment, then, you know, at least I kept you away from something, but it could have been halal, but I wasn't sure. He said, but it's real hard to say halal on these questionable matters, because what if it was haram? You follow that? When I was in Egypt, I had the beautiful opportunity to sit with a very knowledgeable person in Islam. And he doesn't like... For anybody to give him any advertising, so I won't mention his name, nothing like that. It's just that I really respect all of our teachers so much. I can't help but mention at least some reference to them and ask a lot to accept it from him. But he gave me a beautiful statement in English that I never forgot, which basically sums up everything I've said up to this point. Everything in the life that you go out here and do, in the worldly matters, everything you want to do, as far as the law is concerned, is halal for you unless it's specifically forbidden. But everything in worship is totally haram for you unless it's specifically ordered, mandated, or permitted by Allah and His Messenger. Now, some examples. And, and then I'm going to talk about some of the areas where we get confused. An example of worship that you don't play with. Everybody knows Maghrib, Salat is how many rakah? Three. Yes, for Maghrib. Okay. Fajr. How much for Fajr? Two. No doubt, right? And how about Dhuhr? Asr. Isha. And you're from all over the world. You guys are from everywhere. Yes? And we still all agree on that. It doesn't matter if they're Shiites from Iran or Diobandi from Pakistan or if they're whatever. All Muslims know this is basic. So if somebody said, you know what? I feel real holy today. Let me go ahead and double up. I'd like to pray four rakahs for Fajr, eight for Dhuhr, eight for Asr, six for Maghrib, and eight more tonight for Isha. Wow! Nobody would accept that, would they? What they would tell you? Go ahead and pray what's due on time, the regular way, but... If you want to pray some extra, you're welcome to pray all you want to. Two by two by two, as much as you like. Yeah, no problem. So we see right away an innovation that wouldn't be acceptable. Like somebody who said, well, you know, fasting in the day is kind of hard for me, but why don't I fast at night? When the sun goes down, I'll start fasting. When it comes back up, I'll quit. Good idea. I can sleep through it all. <laughs> we do that through Ramadan anyway. <laughs> but... We know that's not acceptable. We wouldn't do that. So these are some examples. Now let's look on the other side. When it comes to areas that are open, can we use a microwave oven? Can we drive a car? Can we fly in an airplane? Every time something new came, like an automobile, flying in airplanes, all these things, whenever something new came, Muslims ran to their scholars. They went to their imams, their mulanas. And they said, is this haram? And I don't blame them. It's good to go and check. It's okay to ask. Unfortunately, a lot of them said, yeah, it's haram. Telephone. Oh, brother, astaghfirullah. You don't know what's in that phone. Could be, oh, weird this stuff. <laughs> what is that? That's very backward. And this actually kept us out of the 20th century. Much of the 20th century came and went with Muslims still living a long time ago. Unfortunately, that's true. For whatever reason, I'm not blaming specifically our educators here, but that is a fact. So 
So we see right away an innovation that wouldn't be acceptable. Like somebody who said, well, you know, fasting in the day is kind of hard for me, but why don't I fast at night? When the sun goes down, I'll start fasting. When it comes back up, I'll quit. Good idea. I can sleep through it all. <laughs> we do that through Ramadan anyway. <laughs> but we know that's not acceptable. We wouldn't do that. So these are some examples. Now let's look on the other side. When it comes to areas that are open, can we use a microwave oven? Can we drive a car? Can we fly in an airplane? Every time something new came, like an automobile, flying in airplanes, all these things, whenever something new came, Muslims ran to their scholars. They went to their imams, their mulanas, and they said, is this haram? And I don't blame them. It's good to go and check. It's okay to ask. Unfortunately, a lot of them said, yeah, it's haram. Telephone. Oh, brother, astaghfirullah. You don't know what's in that phone. Could be, oh, weird this, that. <laughs> what is that? That's very backward. And this actually kept us out of the 20th century. Much of the 20th century came and went with Muslims still living a long time ago. Unfortunately, that's true. For whatever reason, I'm not blaming specifically our educators here, but that is a fact. And today, now we're in the 21st century, and Muslims are all around the world. It's really eminent for us today to take the responsibility to learn what this deen really is all about and be sure to pass that on to next generations. Otherwise, this could cause a serious problem for Muslims in the future. Our youth, they have a right on us. They have the right to know what Islam really teaches. And they have a right to know how to think about the reality of where they live. I'm going to sum up a couple of points. I didn't answer your question about music on purpose because I want to keep your attention. But I want to sum up with a couple of points. Today I visited with our youth here in the building and other places and I asked them some questions. Our youth, by the way, are the best of the kids on the earth today. I love all kids, but Muslim kids are the best. They really are. Yet I found from them, the kids that I've visited with, as much as they would like to know, nobody has really sat with them and given them the opportunity to pick up the real dean. We have our so-called Mulanas and Khatibs standing on mimbars giving speeches in Arabic, Urdu, Bengali, different languages every Friday. And those kids have no clue what it's about. All they know is I got to put a kufi on my head. I have to wear some thing that looks like a dress. And I'm going to go with my father, my grandfather, my uncles. And I have to do this, but without a clue why. Then when they go to school during the week, unfortunately, most of our kids are going to public school. Therefore, they can't dress like that. Even if the school let them, they'd be laughed out of the building. Some of our girls, by the way, even though they can wear the hijab, when they get to their locker, they take it off and put on a ball cap or something else because they just don't want to be embarrassed with that in school and they have no idea why they're doing it anyway. That's a reality. And this is why I mention it to you. If we ignore reality, this is suicide. This is not a joke. There is something that's imminent in front of us and all of us are responsible for it. And that's why we're talking about this subject of educating our educators. Let me come to a couple of points and wrap it up. First of all, our kids are the future of Islam. It's not an option for you or me. It's our responsibility. Regardless of what anybody else does do or doesn't do, you and I both have to say, this is my responsibility. I'm going to do the best I can with what I've got. And I'm going to ask a lot to guide me and guide my kids because we really need this. Then we need to seek competent teachers who can communicate with our youth. I don't just mean language. I mean get down where they are and speak to them on their level. When I talk to our kids, I don't try to address them as a college professor. I don't talk to them about my degrees or how much money I made, or any of the rest of it. Because this is, what has that got to do with it? 
What they want to know is, what's up? Or like they say, what's down with that? And I'm not sure which way to go up or down, but in any case, I try to talk to them so that they realize, okay, this is somebody that'll, that I can talk to that'll listen to me and understand where I'm coming from. The example that I used with a couple of our youth today was kind of funny because I was asking about the Quran and some kids that I know have memorized the entire Quran and we say, mashallah, he memorized the whole Quran. It's great. How old were you when you memorized it, sir? Nine years old. You memorized it in Arabic, but you grew up speaking Urdu, yes or no? You can't even remember back that far. Did they teach you the meaning of what you were saying or just teach you how to recite? Just how to recite. And this is not the exception. It's the absolute rule on the planet. Even for Arabs in Arabic homes where they speak Arabic, they teach their children the Quran cover to cover, but they still don't tell them what it means. And I'm going to challenge every Muslim here today to think about something. That if you said you know the Quran, you personally, you say, yeah, well, I know the Quran. Or I know some of it. Or I know a little of it. I'll challenge you on one letter only. The first letter in the Quran. First letter is what? When you say, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, what's the first letter? Ba. What does it mean? Do you know? Because if you don't know what that one letter means, how could you possibly talk about interpreting the rest of the Quran? Many people with all the translations that I've read always say, in the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Is that true? Now, I have a microphone and you don't, so I'm going to have to talk for you. I understand where you're going. Jazakallah khair. Now, ba, when you use it, depending on how you use it in a sentence, when you translate it to English, you have to consider, did you say like, bil lagutu arabi? In this case, you mean in the Arabic language. It means in. But if you say... For instance, um, I love you for the sake of Allah. We don't say I love you in Allah in English because it means like, are you inside of Allah? What's this? That's crazy. Yes? So see what happens when you try to do a literal translation. It literally, it says with the name of Allah, but you have to understand that in proper English, you have to come up with in the name of of Allah because when you're representing the king or queen for instance you say in the name of the king or the name of the queen you never say with you say in you then say well that's small well if it's so small how come nobody knew it except one person mashallah now if we realize that in learning the Quran and the interpretation of Quran is important then we're going to be ahead of the game and by the way they asked uh, Abdullah ibn Umar they asked him about memorizing the Quran and he had said something about just memorizing Surah Baqarah they said what you only have Surah Baqarah and he said yes we, we used to only memorize the Quran as we understood it and put it into practice meaning that you don't just recite it for no reason so this is a point another point and, and this is where you're going to throw me out and tell me never to come back which is fine with me anyway but one of the things, if we're going to get into the 21st century, we need to go to every single masjid on this planet. And you know that halal thing that we got, that crescent moon on top of the buildings? We need to cut that thing off. Why? Because it has no connection with Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not one connection at all. That represents a symbol of the Ottoman Empire that went down the drain in 1922. It's nothing but a sad reminder of something we don't have anymore. And it makes people think we worship the moon. And even our own kids sometimes ask, well, why do we have that up there? Does it have some connection with the, you know, I don't know. And so we don't need that. Now, I know I made a lot of people mad, right? Telling me my sheikh is saying the wrong stuff from the mimbar, telling me we don't know the Quran. Blah. I'm just trying to make sure that there's no way I can get back. <laughs> I'm destroying my bridge. Tell my bridge building, this is called blowing up your bridges. I'm the left. Music. Islam didn't forbid music. It didn't. What it did, it put the limit on it. And understand, that's the difference. If you say music is haram, you have to have a proof. And there's none. But there's plenty of evidence about the limits of music. 
And that's where you have to go to the scholars and understand why we mustn't participate in these things where they're using musical instruments, singing songs that have wrong implications, and also things that will buzz in your head instead of the Qur'an. So there are serious limits on that, but it's not haram, as long as you stay within the limits. Then, what about smoking? I take another one because I know a lot of people used to ask us about that. They quit asking me because they knew what I was going to say. <laughs> question, and a good scholar, by the way, you know what he'll do? But when you ask a question, he'll ask you a question back. He'll ask you a question back. Because he needs to know before he gives you just a ruling. Do you smoke? If the answer is yes, do you want to continue or would you like to get away from it? If I tell you it's haram, is that going to help you stop? Huh? Because if it'll help you stop, I'll tell you it's haram right now. But let us find out why you're into this thing and then figure out what you can do about it. But the ruling is anything that can kill you is haram. Can smoking kill people? I asked you. I didn't tell you. I asked you. What will happen? Well, you make your own decision. You feel better about it. I decided smoking is haram. I'm going to quit. Instead of, this guy said haram, but I'm going to go ask this guy and see if I can get a better deal. Let's go shopping, fetwa shopping. Have you heard about fetwa shopping? Shop the internet till you get what you want. So inshallah, some of the points that I made today, although open-ended, maybe possibly in the future we can come to some more conclusions on that, but try to keep this in mind. That when it comes to worship, and listen to this phrase, the imams use it every Friday, and you should be listening to the phrase in the translation of the meaning. When he says, And you've heard it and heard it and heard it, but how many times did anybody tell you what it means? The worst of all deeds are innovations into the deen of Islam. And it means regarding those subjects. And those innovations are misguidings, and all misguidings lead to the fire of hell. And may Allah save us from that. I mean. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us nur, the light of knowledge, and let that knowledge spread throughout the Muslim community and raise up from you here, right now, some of you as educators for our Muslims. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make all of us of those who put deen first and dunya later so that we can go to his paradise. I mean. Inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.